be here, folks. Good to have all of you with us today. One day less to the second advent. Amen. Amen. Father, bless the study of your word. I believe it. And I believe probably 99, maybe 100% of the people in this house this morning believe it. They believe every word of it. Amen. They believe the book they have in their hand is the inspired word of God without error. Now, Father, teach us. Lift our mind above this darkened, ignorant, blind world. Lift it higher. Show us, our Heavenly Father, what you'd have us know. We ask it in Jesus' name, and amen. amen. Uh, one of the local churches is having a dance, so if you'd like to go while I've got it up here in the front, we'll fill you in on where you can go and dance. Not that we don't have enough dance halls already, you know. Churches are dancing. Uh, I use the word lightly, church. Uh, it's... Uh, it's, 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 it's come to mean nothing. But in any event, I want you to turn the book of Romans, chapter number 11 with me this morning, please. And uh, I'm going to get into some stuff with you now. I'm going to make you think. And uh, if you are ever in a confrontation with a Jew, and this is in no way this morning, this is not, uh, the, the purpose of this lesson is not to denigrate Jews, per se, but it is to teach the Bible. Uh, would God have prepared his people for the coming of the Messiah? How many believe he would have? Amen. How many believe that 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, they had every reason to believe in him? Amen. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, and, of course, then it begs the question, well, when, why did they reject him? Why did they reject him? And uh, last week uh, I, I spent... Uh, 35, 40, 45 minutes just stand up here lecturing, talking about the formulation of the Babylonian Talmud and how that Israel was taken captive for 70 years. While there, they incorporated into their faith the, the, the idolatrous system of Babylon. Now, here's the way they do it. Here's the way they do it. People are proud. Nations are proud. Religions are proud. So instead of, instead of just coming out right and saying, well, we got this from the Babylonians or we got this from the Hindu, they'll spin it, rewrap it, and act as if they got it. And they're original with it, see. That's the idea. That's the way it is. Men are very proud. How many believe that? Amen. Amen. How many got a problem with pride? <laughs> so uh, Israel came back from 70 years of Babylonian captivity, loaded to the gills with occultism, the occult world, the Babylon, the world of Babylon. Now, Babylon, never in the Bible, never one time, never, ever, ever in the Word of God is ever cast in a good light. It's always a bad light. Babylon has a problem. Babylon is called in the book of Revelation, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Babylon, therefore, in the sight of God, is a horrendous place. But in any event, they came back with, uh, they came back with tr the traditions of the elders being firmly established in a religion. And the Apostle Paul called it the Jews' religion. He said, I profited in the Jews' religion. Now, the reason he says that is because he's trying to tell you that there is a vast difference between the Jews' religion and the religion, for example, of Nathaniel. You remember Nathaniel? You remember what the Lord said about Nathaniel? <clears throat> he said he saw him under a tree. Remember? And then he, this is what he said. He said, this is an Israelite in whom, who, in whom indeed is no guile. Right. All right? He didn't say he was a Christian. He said he was an Israelite. Living under the law of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, following all the light he had, living exactly the way God wanted him to live, the same as Simeon and Anna and many others. Elizabeth, for example, and uh, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. We have people that are mentioned in the New Testament that are up until this law and the prophets were until John, we have these people that are living under the light that they have. They had no problem accepting the Lord Jesus, did they? No, sir. None. Yet, these are the, yet they're Jews. <clears throat> so the reason, the, one, the reason he was rejected is not on, based on Scripture. He was never rejected based on the Word of God. And of course, when we say Word of God, we're talking about Genesis through Malachi. The Lord Jesus Christ was not rejected based on the Word of God. That's a big deal, folks. That's a huge deal. <laughs> That's huge. 
Because if you say to a Jew, then, well, you rejected your Messiah, well, based on what? Because your Bible act, uh, completely uh, presented him with his credentials as the Messiah of Israel. Amen. And then he'll begin to quote to you the Talmud, if he does. And I remember one confrontation at Penny's in Westtown about 25 years ago in the, uh, in the, uh, 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 in the furniture department. I was in there with another brother from church. And we were back there talking, and this Jew, and we didn't know he was a Jew, but all of a sudden it got into witnessing for the Lord, and this Jew made this, made this uh, sarcastic remark about uh, your Lord and your master, Jesus Christ. I said, uh oh, <laughs> that's not coming from a pagan. That, that kind of talk is coming from a Jew. And, uh, and uh, I looked at him and I said, well, what is your faith? He said, I'm a Jew. I said, I knew that. I know you're a Jew. And I said, I said to him, why did you reject the Lord Jesus Christ? He never had, apparently never had that kind of a statement said to him before. Why did you reject him? What's that based on? And then he began to mumble something about, uh, you know, he was illegitimate and he's demon possessed and he's this and he's that and all this. And everything he's saying came straight out of the Talmud. It didn't come out of the word of God. Now, how many know what the Talmud is? All right, the Talmud. So it's good to know these books. How many know what the Koran is, for example? All right, the Hadith. All right, uh, most folks never heard of the Hadith, but it's just as important, in fact, is more important than the Koran. The Koran was the book written by Muhammad. The Hadith was written by Muhammad to interpret the book Muhammad wrote. See what I mean? Like the, like the, uh, like the Talmud, for example, you have the Gemara. All right, the Gemara of the Talmud is basically the instructions to understand the Talmud. You have to have a, you have a, system, of, a system of coding and a system of interpretation. How do I understand it? And, and, of course, the Talmud is far more complicated than just that simple thing. You have the laws of the Talmud called Toledoth and all of that stuff that you get into when you start dealing with the Talmud. Study the Talmud itself would take you years just to, be, to break it down to what's going on. But it's a huge compendium of, uh, of information. And uh, it, it's just the basis of, of, Judaism, of, of, of the faith of Judaism, rabbinic Judaism. All right. Now, I'm going to pull out something for you this morning. <clears throat> and the reason I'm doing this is I'm doing this by, by the way of contrast. Uh, Sir Robert Anderson, who was a detective with Scotland Yard. How many ever heard of him? How many ever heard of Scotland Yard? You know, uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes, Scotland Yard. All right. Everybody's heard of Sherlock Holmes in Scotland Yard. Well, Sir Robert Anderson was a real Sherlock Holmes. He was real, and he was a detective, and he wrote a number of books about the Lord Jesus. One of them is The Coming Prince, about the coming Antichrist, and it's an outstanding book, and I think we have it in our library here. It's in the public domain. You can get on the Internet, just type it in. You can download it probably in electronic form and read it. But in any event, Sir Robert Anderson taught by contrast and the contrast that he used was to say, now these people believe this, but look at this. How could they believe this if this is true? See what I mean? How can you believe this if this is true? Now what I'm going to do today is to destroy the Talmud in one simple way, okay? One simple thing, I'm going to destroy the Talmud. So how are you going to do that? By taking what they believe about demons and comparing that with the New Testament. Uh, Edersheim, Alfred Edersheim is a, was a converted Jew, lived in the 1800s. He wrote the best book that I have ever seen on the life of Christ. It's called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. It's also in the public domain. You can get that book anywhere you want. It's about that thick in printed form. It's an outstanding book. And he does an enormous amount of research into the Talmud, what the Talmud says about Christ, into the history of the Jewish people, and all of this huge body of work. I'm going to pull one thing out for you this morning, and it's going to be demons. Now, many of you have studied demons in the New Testament, all right? The word demon itself does not show up in the text of, of the English text, but it is in the Greek text. It's all over the place. And they translate it, evil spirit, unclean spirit, and so forth, all right? That's the way the King James translators translated it. And, for example, if you just take the word demon and take it from Greek and put it in English, you've transliterated it. You haven't translated it. See what I mean? Greek is daimonion or daimon, all right? If you take that out of Greek, and put it into English and say demon, you haven't translated anything. You're just simply taking the word out of Greek and putting it into English. For example, over there in the book of Acts, when, uh, when uh, uh, this is the King James Bible is slammed for this a lot of times. 
uh, when Herod was going to, to, to observe a feast day, I forget what chapter of Acts it's in. The, the Hebrew word is Pascha. That's the Hebrew word, all right? A first year Hebrew student, first year, knows exactly what that word means. Pascha is Passover, okay? Passover. But Herod was a pagan king. And so the King James translators translated that word as it applied to that pagan king. And do you know what word they put in there? Easter, Easter. exactly. Easter. They put Easter in there for Ishtar associated with their pagan king. Now, I don't want to make anybody mad, but that's what it came from, and that's what it relates to. It has nothing to do with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He arose from the dead Amen. on the third day, and we preach that Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. But when some pagan professor at University of Tennessee comes up to you and says to you, don't you know where the word Easter came from? Look at him and say, I sure do. And, her, and she's blazoned all over the gate over there at Babylon. And it's called the Ishtar Gate. We certainly do. But you see, that's translating the word. That's translating it. That's bringing it out of that language and putting it into the English language. And in this case, they made an interpretation out of it. Okay, now let's got, get back to this text. Here's what Edersheim says about the, about the Jewish uh, rabbinical position on demons. It's very interesting. If you'll just listen to this, you'll be amazed at what you're hearing. And then put your thinking cap on for a minute. Now here are the rabbinic views. Probably the nearest approach to the idea of Josephus, and he's referring back to Josephus, and you all know who he is. He's that Jewish historian. That demons were the souls of the wicked. All right. That's who they were teaching is the perhaps allegorical statement that the backbone of... Now watch this. Watch this. Think. Let me go back and read it from the, from the front. Probably the nearest approach to the idea of Josephus, that demons were the souls of the wicked, is the perhaps allegorical statement that the backbone of a person who did not bow down to worship God became a shed. That's their word for demon. Or a demon. Now... Does that ring a bell? What's the backbone associated with? Spine. Kundalini yoga. All right, we're getting it, aren't we? All right, the dots are beginning to connect. See what I mean? Where did they get that from? Whatever gave a Hebrew an idea, these rabbinic Jews, that a demon is associated with the backbone of someone. See what I mean? There's a direct connection there between what they're teaching and kundalini yoga that these ignorant so-called Christian churches are bringing right into their midst with yoga, with kundalini yoga, with tantric sex and all the rest that goes with it. And you can get on the website and, and, and all that stuff's on there. You can, it, ad nauseum. All right. And now go on. The ordinary names of demons are evil spirits or unclean spirits. Uh, Shedim, so forth. A demon, male or female, either because of their chief habitation is in desolate places or from the word to fly about or from to rebel. A demoniac is called a sofa, geber shedim. Geber is one of the Hebrew words for man. Even this, that demons are supposed to eat and drink to propagate themselves and to die, distinguishes them from the demons of the New Testament. Did you hear that? The food of demons consists of certain elements in fire and water and of certain odors. Hence the mode of incantation by incense made of certain ingredients. Where do you think they got that from? Of their origin, number, habitation, and general influence, sufficient has been said in the appendix on demonology. It is more important here to notice these two Jewish ideas that demons entered into or took possession of men and that many diseases were due to their agency. The farmers frequently express the evil spirit constrains a man to do certain things such as to pass beyond the Sabbath boundary, to eat the Passover bread. But it reads more like a caustic than a serious remark when we are informed that these three things deprive a man of his free will and make him transgress. The Cuthians, an evil spirit in poverty, uh, diseases such as rabbis, angina, asthma, accidents, such as an encounter with a wild bull are due to their agency, which happily is not unlimited. Stated in Appendix 13, the most dangerous demons are those of the dirty secret places. Even numbers are always dangerous. 
so is anything that comes from unwashing hands. For such or similar oversights, a whole legion of demons is on the watch. On the evening of the Passover, the demons are bound, and in general, their power has now been restricted chiefly to the eaves of Wednesday and the Sabbath. Yet there are, as we can see, as we shall see, circumstances in which it would be foolhardy to risk their encounter without here entering on views expressed in the Talmud about prophecy, visions, and dreams, we turn to questions germane to the subject, and on he goes. He writes in a pretty high scholarly uh, fashion, but all you have to do is just read it and pray over it and ask God to give you wisdom in what he's trying to say. And he talks about how that, uh, let me see if I can find this over here. I should have had it marked. I get into so much of this stuff. Here it is. Uh, Similarly, now watch this superstition. The shadow of the moon, of certain trees, and of other objects is dangerous because demons love to hide there. Much caution must also be observed in regard to the water with which the hands are washed in the morning as well as in regard of oil for anointing, which must never be taken from a strange vessel which might have been bewitched. See this? And on it goes. On and on and on and on and on. Now, all right, let's just come down to the bottom line. Where did that come from? That came out of the Talmud. <clears throat> the New Testament knows nothing of all of this foolish superstition as it relates to demons. There's a lot the New Testament does not say about demons, but what it does say about demons in no wise is connected with this. This is, this is straight from Babylon. This kind of superstitious junk about Dark spots, places you are, voices, incantations, and all of this. Uh, this stuff, most of the stuff in Babylon is superstitious from ignorance. But a lot of it, to create confusion, is a product of the devil to control. Amen. What he'll do is to get you, because of, your, uh, because of your superstition and ignorance, and your intuitiveness is to begin to reach into it and find out what's going on. First thing you know, they grab you. Here's the thing about demons. They're very vain. They're in here right now. The moment you start talking about them, they come around. They're very vain. And a preoccupation with demons is an indication the individual's not walking in the spirit of God and in communion and fellowship with the Lord. Now, if the New Testament writers, which were Jews, did not write any of this stuff about demons... Had they done that, you could have made a connection between the New Testament and the Talmud, and you could have said to yourself, yeah, it's written by the same crowd that wrote the Talmud, a bunch of ignorant, stupid, superstitious Jews, you know, who were energized by Babylon. And that would have taken away from the inspiration of the Scripture. The Scripture is written on a much higher level. Amen. That demons are unclean? Yes. That they go about? Yes. That they are restless? Yes. That they can leave one body and go into another? Yes. That, but the demon, the New Testament nowhere tells you where they came from. It nowhere tells you that they die. It nowhere tells you that they, that they, that they eat like men uh, eat. The New Testament doesn't say a word about things like that that are just taken for granted in the Talmud. Now, how many of you are following what I'm saying here? There is no way the Talmud and the New Testament can be reconciled. Amen. All right? But think for a moment with me. I can take the Talmud and I can take Hinduism and the Babylonian religion and I can connect the dots all over the place. I found my source. I found the source of the Talmud. You see what I'm saying? The source of the Talmud is Babylon. Now it morphed into a more, what you, the, the term is esoteric. That simply means inside, hidden. It morphed into an esoteric body which is called the Kabbalah. And some of the big stars out there in Hollywood have been practicing the, the, the Kabbalah. Right. They found, they, found mystic, they found the mystic, supernatural, spiritual power of the Talmud. Let me introduce you. No, no, I don't hear it. <laughs> Let me tell you about the Lord God that made it all and died for you on the cross. See? But that's what we're dealing with now. All right, now you've looked at, you're looking at something here, and you're going to have to make a decision. Do I believe my New Testament? All right, now, where did my New Testament come from? Did it come from Babylon, or did it come from a much higher source? 
See, see what it's done to you? Here we, come, here, we, here we bring Sir Robert Anderson back in now. Sir Robert Anderson would say, now look at the New Testament. All right, the New Testament is way above that. A lot of times the thing the Bible does not say screams louder than what it does say <laughs> because it leaves it, it leaves it for revelation from God. All right, I've got the New Testament right here. And, I can, and the New Testament nowhere ever, 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 ever drops down to the level of superstition and ignorance. Amen. See, it's much higher than that. All right, now, I've got the Babylonian Talmud over here, and it's full of superstition and ignorance. Yet this is the book, this is the book, the Babylonian Talmud, that the Jews use to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you get that? Yes, sir. It's not based on anything they heard from God. Their, their rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ is based on superstition, foolish, ignorant, paganism, and occultism. Amen. Yeah, buddy, now I've got, my John, I've got my man. I know what's going on. That in itself, what I just gave you right there. That what I, we've been in here 25 minutes. What I gave you right there is, is some of the most profound things you'll ever hear in your life. Because not only does it show you that the very people that the Lord Jesus Christ came from, it shows you why they rejected him. But it also shows you how powerful this book is that you've got in your hands right here that's called the Holy Bible. Amen. Now, the fellow sitting over here on the hill, the professor of religion at UT, He'll tell you that this book, and this, of course, is just a piece of paper, but it's got the words of the Talmud in it, and the Talmud, and the Koran, and the Bhagavad Kavita, or whatever, how you pronounce that thing, all the Hindu, that's, that's Hindu writing, some of them, and the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and, uh, and the Hadith, and the Koran, and on and on and on and on it goes, whatever, whatever religion you want to, put them all together and they're all equal. And he's got a Ph.D. behind his name. It's scary, isn't it? The Bible said, for this they are willingly ignorant. Amen. I just showed you how that the Bible is worlds above the Babylonian Talmud. Amen. Because I connected the Talmud with Babylon. I connected the Talmud with superstition and ignorance. And this is just one thing. Man, if you get, to, I mean, it's, it, it blows your mind if you want to spend a little time reading some of the stuff in the Talmud about how they portray the goyim, and that's what you are. I'm a goyim. Uh, what does that mean? You want me to tell you the truth about it? I know what they tell me it means. Are you following me? But I'm not so sure that's what it really means. <laughs> are you following me? When they call you a goyim, they know what it means. But when they tell you what it means, they're telling it you for your consumption. Not that it really means that. It may mean something a whole lot more sinister. But it's for your public consumption. That's the way the government operates. Public consumption. Then the elite, they operate on one level. And then the, you know, the visible on the other. That's the way it all works. There's the elite up here. And then there's the one down here that you vote for. But the one up here is the one who pulls the strings. You go to the polls and you vote for the puppet that the puppeteer is moving. Uh, keep this in mind. It was George Bush that pumped millions and billions of dollars into Wall Street. Remember? That was a Republican that did that. Keep that in mind. That was a Republican that did that. Before you come down and blame the Democrats for everything. Yeah. Yeah. So what are, you, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, I'll just be honest with you, all right? You want me to be honest? <laughs> you wouldn't want me to lie to you. If we really did, if we could really get a hold of the conflict, if we could really see what's really going on, it would scare every last one of us to death. If we could see the forces arrayed and see what's really going on right now, and I'm not talking about flesh and blood, 
Now, I'm not talking about flesh and blood. I'm talking about principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm talking about the purpose of God. I'm talking about that eternal being that will do all things according to the counsel of his own will. I'm talking about the one who allows Satan to rise as high as he can rise and the wicked mind to comprehend and grasp as much as it can do and force itself as far as it can go and still that eternal being will outsmart them because he's God. There's only one God. Only one. Amen. Yes, sir. Kundalini, yeah. Yeah, what'd you find, brother? Oh, me. Oh, I did. <laughs> well, I hope it does. Get out. I, there's some people out there. Yeah, isn't that something? Okay, now let's just analyze that for a moment. Here are all these pastors, okay, these reverends standing in the pulpits in America and wherever. And they're not saying a word to their people against it. Well, the bottom line is the average pastor will embrace anything that keeps peace in his church and makes it grow yes, sir. and gets more money in the plate. Is that true? Absolutely. Now, that's a given. All right. So what happens? Well, here's a new movement in quote, unquote, Christianity. What am I going to do? Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to survive. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see to it that I have a paycheck every week. That's what I'm going to do. So let's find out what the official position on this is. So I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to call some of the big dogs in my, in my, uh, in my uh, 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 denomination or movement or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> Brother so-and-so, what do we believe about this? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, brother. <laughs> He got out. What's his name, brother? But that's typical. Right. But that's typical, brother. Yes, sir. Yoga's a door that takes you into that world. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a temple over there in uh, Lan La Kapoor, Lanpur, uh, uh, something. I don't know what it is. It's over there in India. I've watched two or three documentaries on this thing, and it amazes me. There's a temple over there. That thing, they don't know how old it is. It's 1,500 years old, 2,000 years old, whatever. And it's old, no question about that. And this thing is loaded, I mean, from cover to cover with every kind of a sexual thing you can think of. But it's also religious. Very religious. Yes. Right. So you watch the connection between the two. So you have a, you have a so-called Christian pastor and he... He begins yoga classes in his church, starts yoga classes, yoga classes to get the people to meditate more. Well, it has a, it has a number of uh, benefits from it, physical, mental, spiritual, and all this. And, and so what's he done? He's introduced his people to a spirit world that's going to drag him straight to hell. Straight to hell. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like I said to you, the other, I think it was Wednesday night. What differentiates you from an unbeliever is the spirit of God that's in you. It's not the babble that comes out of your mouth about what you believe. That's meaningless anymore. That doesn't mean a thing. Well, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe the Bible. I'll shut up. Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Because if you really have the Holy Ghost in you, He is that unction from the Father that immediately raises red flags when this garbage starts coming toward you. Just like this man, when he was born again, he's talking about the very moment he got saved. Out of it he went disassociated himself completely. Cut the bond right on the, on the spot. 
Done with it. And that's the, that's, that's the way it is. It's not the bunch of Bible that comes out of your mouth. I know the Bible said from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. I realize that. But the scripture says to try the spirits. And so the mouth may speak these things, but the, you'll judge a tree by the fruit it bears. All right? What you're doing here is looking at a completeness of the individual, the whole person, you know. And that's what you're getting into. How much time's left, though? Really? I mean, you know what you hear in here, they're put, they, they take that and put it on the web. Surely I'm not the only man around preaching on this stuff. I know there's others. I know there are. Because I get the material from places. There's, there, I've got websites that I could recommend to you, but I could, the problem is if I recommend these websites to you, if something comes on there that, that may not necessarily be what we believe or agree with, you know, you're, you, you're going to come back to the preacher and say, well, preacher, I saw such and such on that website. You're liable to see anything. But the truth is still the truth. And uh, I've, I've told you before, time and again, about Crossroads. Barrett Kios, K-J-O-S. Barrett, B-E-R-I-T. It's called Crossroads, I believe is the name of that website. And you type her name into the Internet, and she'll put you on a trail of links that'll take you to the Lighthouse Trails. That's one, Lighthouse Trails. And, then the, and here's the reason I'm starting here is because there's an awful lot of people out there, folks, that don't go to church very much. That are that are that are that have enough sense to know that something wicked's coming into this country, and they're reporting on a lot of this stuff, and they're not reporting necessarily from a Christian perspective, but they're telling the truth. You you follow me on that? So you got to you got to kind of you got to temper what you're watching there and listening to, because facts are facts, even if they come out of the mouth of a devil. This is what have we to do with thee, thou holy one of God? Well, that's the truth, but it came out of the mouth of a demon. See. So start out with Crossroads, Barrett Kios, K-J-O-S, B-E-R-I-T, K-J-O-S. She will plug you in to a bunch of links. She's a good Christian lady. Uh, and then uh, Lighthouse Trails. I found that to be a good site. There are others, but some of these guys, uh, they've got the truth on one hand, then they go off into space on the other. And you've got to watch them. I mean, <laughs> you've got to watch them. You've got to watch them. There's a bunch of them out there, folks, that think most of the people walking around are a bunch of lizards. They think that they think they, they do. They, 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 it's this, what, is, what, what do they call this? Uh, reptilian. Reptilian. And they've got, they've got pictures of the president on there with slitted eyes. It, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, all of this. And these reptilians are supposed to be Aliens that have been planted among us, or some of them were even born, and and uh, here, and and you get off into that, and first thing you know, you just you you, you got to watch this stuff. Satan is smart, and he knows how to put you on a diversion. He knows how to get you sideways. So, leave it alone. Stick with stick with the Christian witness and testimony, and uh, you'll get all you can handle right there. I guarantee it. All right. So now the Talmud was used by Satan to cause rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to come back and look at something with me now. That's quite remarkable in the book of Romans 11, verse 24. Romans 11, 24. If thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree. How much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Okay. Now, the Bible has something what to say about trees. For example, the oak tree is not set in a very good fashion in the Bible. And uh, in the New Testament, there was a tree there that, that uh, Zacchaeus was in, and he came down. And uh, what was that called? Sycamore tree. Now, here's the thing you've got to watch for. It may not necessarily be the sycamore you're accustomed to or the oak you're accustomed to. Uh, terebinth and uh, 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 the, the ark was built out of what? Gopher wood. <laughs> Go try to find out what they're talking about on gopher wood. It'll run you crazy. But uh, no question in my mind that it that was a wood that was gopher wood that existed in that day. You know, I don't worry myself to death on stuff like that. But the olive... 
The olive is clear in the Bible. It's set in a good, a good, a good, uh, uh, good, good, a good place, good aspect. And from the olive comes a fruit, the olive. From the fruit comes an oil, the olive oil. The olive oil is used in the Old Testament as, a, as the basis for a mixture of spices that is made into the holy anointing oil, which becomes the oil that is placed on the forehead and the tip of the toe and so forth of the high priest. And he is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the olive oil is a good thing. It's set in a good context. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the place to pray the night before he was taken, the last place he prayed at in freedom on the face of this earth was where? Exactly, the Mount of Olives. And what was the garden? Gethsemane. All right, that word Gethsemane, Gethsemane. I think it's a, I think it's an, I think it's a, not Greek word, but a, uh, what's that other language? Aramaic. And I believe it means an olive press. Olive press. Olive press. It presses the olive oil, okay? Now think about what's happening there at Gethsemane. The Lord Jesus Christ is praying. The Bible said, as great drops of blood came forth from him, he was in such a state of intense prayer and agony. The, Greek, the word there is agonia, which is, you know, is literally a transliteration into agony. He was in agony. That is a picture of the very life being pressed out of him because olive oil is a picture of life, the olive oil. The olive tree, therefore, is a tree of life, picture of life, right? Now, I didn't say that it was the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Nobody knows what that tree of life was. But uh, uh, the olive tree, uh, you know, is a in typology throughout the Bible, is a tree of life. It's a tree of life. He left the Mount of Olives. Pardon? He, left he ascended from the Mount of Olives, didn't he? He ascended. He ascended. He ascended from the same spot where he gave up his freedom. It was there they took him captive at Gethsemane. So the olive tree in the Bible is set in a good context. Very good. Now, you've also got the vine tree. It's called a tree, but you know it's a vine. The wood of the vine tree is useless. It's not worth much. You might make wreaths out of it or what have you, but the wood itself is not worth anything. And that's the Bible says it's not. But the fruit of the vine tree is something else altogether, isn't it? Okay. All right, it produces wine. The fruit of the vine tree. Of course, it produces grape juice. Then a process has to take place for it to become wine. All right. Now, there's another tree in the Bible. It's called a fig tree. You know the fig tree. Do you remember during the ministry of the Lord, he came upon one, had its leaves, but had no fruit. And what did he do to that tree? He cursed it, and it withered. All right. What was the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they found themselves naked? They didn't know they were naked before because they were covered with glory. Fig leaves. They covered themselves. All right. So fig leaves show up first time in the Bible. They show up. They show up as a representation of man's feeble attempt to cover something, right? And it's feeble, believe me. And when the Lord covered them, he didn't cover them with, with uh, fig leaves, did he? Fig tree. What did he cover them with? The skin? Sheepskins. The lamb, all right? So we've talked about a fig. We've talked about a, we've talked about a, a, a vine. And then we've talked about an olive. Now look over here in Romans 11. Pardon? Yes. To shed blood, yes, he had to shed blood because he took it from a living thing. Yes, he did. Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> I, I, for a moment, I didn't get your, your, your thinking, but yes, they had to, the blood was taken from an animal that was alive that had to be, pardon? Absolutely. Both elements are involved in it. So uh, you, have, you have a vine, you have an olive tree, and then you have a, you have a, uh, uh, a uh, fig tree, right? Now, other trees are mentioned, but these three trees have a definite relationship with Israel, okay? That's why Paul uses an olive tree in Romans 11, because it, it has a definite relationship with Israel. Now, I want you to go back with me. We're going to run out of time, but I just want to give you this before we leave out here today. To Isaiah chapter number 5. In Isaiah 5 and verse 1, the scripture says, 
Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard, his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard, see, vineyard, in a very fruitful hill. He fenced it, gathered out the stones thereof, planted it with the choicest vine, built a tower in the midst of it, also made a wine press there, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth, that's against nature, that's against nature. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, the men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. All right. Now, he planted Israel as a natural olive tree. He cut the branches off and took a wild branch and grafted it into the natural olive tree. That's against nature. He plants a vine that is a good vine in Isaiah chapter number 5. And the thing winds up being a wild vine. That's against nature. That's against the natural order of God. In that, he's teaching a lesson to Israel that this bears directly on them and has something to do with them, either spiritually, religiously, or naturally. Now, in the book of Romans chapter number 11, when Israel was set aside, diminished, not destroyed, but diminished. What faith ascended above it and became the hand of God on the earth today? The faith of Christ. There is only one way, and there's only one cross, and there's only one light in this world. Not two lights, three lights, but one light. But God is not finished with Israel. That must be, got to understand that. That's what's big about this deal here. <laughs> if we miss that, we've missed Romans 11 completely. It is the faith of Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. That's it. And so we preach Christ and Him crucified. But where did we come from? Yeah, where did the church come from? All right, now, okay. You're both right. As a people, we came from the wild. As the Gentiles in Romans 11, that's where we came from. But our faith came from that natural olive tree. Amen. Yes, sir. It was the natural outgrowth of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, sir. That's why I spent all this time about showing you how that when, when, when the Lord Jesus was rejected by the Jews as being their Messiah, they did not reject him based on the Bible. The Bible prepared them for the Messiah. Babylon prepared them for the Antichrist and to reject him. And that's where we'll go next week. We'll go to the people and we'll go to their faith. And we'll show you how the natural olive tree, the natural vine, and the fig tree all fit together as it relates to Israel. Yes, ma'am. Alfred. Alfred, A-L-F-R-E-D. Alfred. I think so, yes. Just, just type in The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. That's one of the best known books in the world. We have it in the library back here. Second shelf up, Amy, in, in the library. It's got uh, shucks, 1,000 pages, 1,200 pages. It's a big book. You won't read it overnight. <laughs> Unless you read 500 words a minute. <laughs> I know some folks that can talk 60 words a minute with gust up to 90. That's pretty good, don't you think? <laughs> Brother Fanolio dismisses. <laughs> <laughs>